Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming out on this rainy night. Um, I'm Lisa Benenson. I'm the Vice President for Communications at the Brennan Center for Justice. Um, we are a nonpartisan law and policy institute affiliated with NYU School of Law. As you've probably noticed, there's a little bit um, going on in the world. And so we are very grateful that tonight we have two distinguished guests who will likely have a thing or two to say about that. Susan Rice, as you know, is the former US ambassador to the United Nations and national security advisor to President Barack Obama. We are here tonight to celebrate the publication of Susan's new book, Tough Love, My Story worth of the Things Worth Fighting For. Susan has been on the front lines of US diplomacy and foreign policy, and as you've probably heard, she is not really known as someone who holds back. <laughs> so we're figuring that we're in for a really interesting night. And who better to get Susan going on the critical questions of the day than the one and only Andrea Mitchell. She is NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent and host of NBC's Andrea Mitchell Reports. Please welcome Susan Rice and Andrea Mitchell. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, all of you, so much. It is wonderful to be here at the Brennan Center, this wonderful venue, and to be here celebrating Tough Love, the publication of Susan Rice's book. Susan, it's great to see you. And it's not as though we don't have a few things to talk about on the foreign policy front. But what's so extraordinary about Tough Love is that you take an unsparing look at the triumphs and the challenges of conducting foreign policy in the overheated environment, which was overheated then. It's even more overheated now as well as revealing what it is like to grow up in Washington in a complicated but loving family, the issues of your, your parents, to being a wife and mother while conducting foreign policy at the highest level of the US government. And so I, let's start with the title, Why Tough Love? Well, before we go there, let me just begin by saying thank you to Lisa and the Brennan Center for hosting us. Thank you so much, Andrea, for being here and for doing this and hi everybody it's nice <laughs> it's nice to be back in New York and it's especially nice to see so many friends and dear colleagues here so I'm very excited to start my book tour here it's called tough love because that's how I was raised by my parents that's how I've tried to raise my kids it's also how I've tried to lead my teams in government and public service as some of them here can attest and it's also, frankly, how I have related to our country. And tough love means that you love fiercely, but not uncritically. That is, if you're the child of parents who are raising you that way, you know they're going to tell you when you're screwing up. They're not going to whitewash things for you. And when they tell you good job and that you've done a great job, you know they really mean it. And that's how I've tried to be a mother as well. Um, you know, my kids know that if they step out of line, they'll hear it. And they also know that, you know, when I'm able to tell them that, that, you know, you've just done an amazing thing and I'm so proud of you, which I say to both of them very often, that that, that comes from a genuine place. And so I think as leaders, as, as parents, as human beings, we don't do each other any service by whitewashing things and sugarcoating stuff. We get better when we have people who care enough about us to tell us the truth. And my dad, as he always used to give me and my brother advice, would say, you know, you may not want to hear this, but understand it's coming from somebody who has your best interests at heart. And, you know, we don't live in a perfect country, but we live in a phenomenally impressive country that I love from the bottom of my heart. And as I've tried to serve, and lead and represent us on the global stage, I do it also without varnish. There are times when our stuff is out of kilter, and we need to acknowledge it and learn from our mistakes and build upon our history. And we'll get to this moment today, but that's How really important language. is it for a president of the United States to have advisors who will tell him or her when they are going off course. It's absolutely essential. And if we don't have that, we're in deep trouble. And I think, frankly, particularly now, three and a half years into this administration, 
people who have sufficient integrity and self-respect have, for the most part, left. And that's a real problem. When I uh, served President Obama, uh, there were many mornings when I walked in the Oval Office to give the briefing in the Presidential Daily Briefing, the PDB, and what I had to say, he didn't want to hear because it was either unpleasant or complicated or problematic. Uh, and, but he knew and he expected me to give it to him unvarnished. And, you know, from a story I tell in the book, this is on the small spectrum, small end of the spectrum to big issues. Uh, you know, I had to tell him when his stuff wasn't tight. And the funny example of that is on St. Patrick's Day, uh, it's a big deal in the White House. Um, the Irish Prime Minister comes and everybody's wearing flowery green boutonnieres and they go up to Capitol Hill and have a big luncheon. And so the morning of the PDB, the President comes downstairs from his residence into the Oval Office and he's wearing a tie that is clearly not green. <laughs> <laughs> It's in fact this weird blue teal flecked thing. <laughs> and I said, Mr. President, that tie is not green. And he's like, come on, Rice. The, the tie is perfectly green. And so I call for reinforcements. Ferial, his, sec his, his assistant, <laughs> Pete Souza, the photographer. <laughs> Tell this man the tie is not green. And they finally said, you know, Mr. President really isn't green. <laughs> And so, huffing and puffing, he walks out of the Oval Office, back up to the residence, and comes back down in a traditional, perfectly green tie. And then we move on and do the briefing. Next year, 365 days later, <laughs> comes in on St. Patrick's Day wearing that teal fleck tie. <laughs> I said, man, come on, don't you remember we had this conversation last year? It wasn't green last year, and it's not green this year. And everybody chimed right in and said, yeah, not, not, not green. So he goes back up, comes back down, green tie, you know, small stuff. But then you got to tell them the big stuff, too. And, and that's what a president needs in, in his closest advisors. The president of the United States came out today while he's under investigation for a conversation which the White House released in which he very clearly says to the Ukrainian leader, I need a favor, and that favor, he then goes on to explain, involves investigating his chief, one of his chief political adversaries, and comes out on the South Lawn today and says explicitly when asked, after dodging the question several times yesterday at a news conference, why did, you know, what did you want President Zelenko t to do and he says, I wanted him to investigate the Bidens. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, and I think the Chinese should investigate him, them also. And he goes on to riff about what he's alleging the former vice president and his son may or may not have done in China, uh, a lot of which has been completely discredited. What are the implications? And then he goes on to say, I mean, I'm, I've got the, the quote right here because it was so extraordinary. I have a lot of options on China. If they don't do what we want, we have tremendous power. This is in the middle of a trade war that... Okay, okay. even for me. <laughs> I'm just How throwing this out How many days here. Brian Williams will tell us we're into the administration? I got off a plane from Boston to New York midday today to see that news, and I even couldn't believe it. I was like, this is qualitatively at a whole new level. Now, how many days do we say that about what happened the day before? So, but this truly is unbelievable. And let's just unpack what happened. A president who swears that he didn't ask the Russians to interfere in our election in 2016, where all the evidence is to the contrary, now admits after denying and then admitting that he has now asked the Ukrainians to provide dirt on a political opponent and in, interfere in our elections, corrupt our democracy. But today, 
by asking China to do the same. He's now inviting our most formidable adversary with the means to interfere in our elections without his blessing to do so. And just think about it. China must be looking at this and thinking at least two things. One is the President of the United States is dangerously unhinged and highly unpredictable and extremely vulnerable. And maybe this is a good time to steal second base. Is second base in the South China Sea? Is it in cyberspace? Is it in trade? But we just you know, basically opened our coat and you know, exposed ourselves to our biggest adversary. Second thing is, if you're China and you're thinking, you know, he just told us what it's going to take to end this trade war. If we give him some manufactured, made up dirt on Joe Biden, what do you think they think they can get in a negotiation on trade or for Huawei or whatever it is they want? He just sold out our manufacturers, our farmers, every single one of us for some BS dirt that doesn't exist on Joe Biden. And I'll be gobsmacked if the Chinese aren't smart enough to take him up on it. Let me ask you about President Zelensky in Ukraine. <laughs> Sorry. This is crazy. <laughs> Who runs for office on two promises. I'm going to end corruption, and I'm going to push back against Vladimir Putin and try to regain control of our territory. He then discovers that he is being pressured by the president's personal lawyer for months in a campaign undercutting the ambassador to Ukraine, who's now been recalled, and then by the president of the United States after the vice president does not show up for his inaugural. So that's a snub. And he gets this phone call and is, after the 391 million dollars is frozen in the leverage that he really needs in these negotiations with Vladimir Putin. So now this week, after all of this has transpired, he is agreeing to terms with Putin, which are terribly advantageous to the Russians. What is the bigger picture as to how Putin is viewing us tonight? Well, Putin already knows that you know we're punks. I mean, he's got that, that, that he had sorted out back in 2016. So, but what's worse is, think of the bigger picture here is that by withholding badly needed military aid to the Ukrainians, when they've got Russian troops on their soil and it's still a hot war, we're basically saying to the Ukrainians, you know, Trump is saying, that we don't care what the Russians do. We just want some dirt for me personally, me, myself, and I. So, and the crowd strike thing? How is that about anything other than trying to whitewash Russian interference and make up a manufactured thing about Ukraine, which had, as far as I'm aware, nothing to do with the 2016 election? So if you put all these pieces together, including what you just described, it adds up to let's sell out Ukraine for the benefit of Russia. Now there's a theme here. It goes back a few years. So the, the, the danger is not only that we have a president who is conducting foreign policy and national security divorced entirely from our national interest, solely, it seems, in service of his personal political interest, and maybe on occasion his financial interest. But we also have two very significant adversaries that are already have been benefiting or are in a position to benefit from this. China, it was Christmas in China today. Seriously.
the Secretary of State. <laughs> Mike Pompeo, for whatever, however difficult it was to manage the Rudy Giuliani shadow diplomacy, and I, I don't know, you know, how much he may have or didn't push back against this. But for at least 10 days, he had two opportunities to acknowledge that he was on that call. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how those calls work and what is normally done with the record, the notes of such calls. How deeply are they safeguarded in um, the most secure systems in the, in the White House? Okay, so first of all, just for the record, I never can recall a presidential phone call in which the Secretary of State was listening in. I can't say that that never ever happened. I don't believe it happened in my tenure. There's some people here who might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but, right? Then, so that's weird. What about the National Security Advisor? But the fact that the National Security Advisor apparently wasn't on the call is even weirder. I don't know of a single presidential phone call on which either the National Security Advisor or a Deputy National Security Advisor wasn't listening, in addition to the substantive policy experts. So the way this is supposed to work, first of all, the expert staff on the NSC write a briefing memo with talking points to the President of the United States, which presumably the President reads. <laughs> and then if the President has some problem with the talking points, he would say to the staff, you know, why don't we say this rather than this, and I'm concerned about that, go fix it, come back, place a phone call. <clears throat> in normal times, the phone call would be taken, if it's in business hours, in the Oval Office, Staff would be present, the National Security Advisor and Deputy National Security Advisor, one of the two are often both. The senior director for the region in question, the director for the country in question, and maybe one or two other staffers, plus a person from the White House Situation Room or the executive secretary who's there to connect the call and make sure that all the logistics work. Downstairs in the Situation Room would be two or three expert note takers who record uh, th the call verbatim, not, be, not physically record, but record it in writing. And then maybe some more expert policy staffers. So there's a cadre of people who are hearing this phone call. And in every circumstance that I can think of, the transcript of the call, once it's completed, is loaded onto the normal, classified National Security Council system, which is classified up to the top secret level, by the way. So, you know, you, you can put virtually every transcript that you'd have in a phone call on that system, and that's what we did. In the rare instance, and it, I can't say it didn't happen, but I can't also recall a circumstance where it did happen. In the rare instance that the contents of a phone call were so highly classified, compartmented, to the extent that, they, that it required placement on the, the most sensitive system, then that could happen. But it's only if the contents of the call were that super secret classified. And you're talking about the bin Laden raid. You're talking about an asset, a, a covert op with a foreign leader. I'm just. Positing. You're just positing, yeah. She's positing. <laughs> I can say it if you, you can't. So keep positing. You, you, you're, you're getting warm. <laughs> it, it has to merit that. And frankly, the, I, it's hard to imagine what foreign leader we'd be talking to about stuff that sensitive unless they're a Five Eyes partner, probably. That's the, it, it would not be President Zelensky of Ukraine. Right. Exactly. And then you see that transcript, and there's nothing classified in it. It's all like, you know, help a brother out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you about your, some of your experiences. Give us an example of when you had to tell the President of the United States 
you write about it in the book. Let's talk about Syria, for instance. I recall that, that Labor Day weekend on the, the red line in Syria when the Secretary of State, around noon, because we were carrying it live, came out and gave what was described as a Churchillian speech. You know, the red line has been crossed, chemical weapons have been used. And we all assumed that on that weekend, something was gonna happen. And later that afternoon, I believe the president and the chief of staff went on a walk around the South Grounds. And then there was a meeting in the Oval Office. And you talk about the ramifications of that. So the, I describe it some length in the book that after the, the same day that, that Kerry gave the speech in the morning, we had yet another principals, actually National Security Council meeting in the, the White House Situation Room with President Obama where in fact we had approved the final targets. He had blessed them and we were only uh, worried about frankly getting United Nations personnel out of harm's way. Uh, and so all of us thought that we were um, very close to action. And uh, then some hours later, that evening, after uh, Dennis McDonough, the, the chief of staff, had gone on a walk with the president, Dennis came to my doorway and said, uh, wanted to let you know that we were at this conversation and the president has decided that the wisest course is to proceed, but to proceed with the backing of Congress. So he wanted to seek congressional support, approval, for this military action in Syria. And he wanted it for a very <laughs> clever reason, quite frankly, which is that he anticipated that if we were really, if we, once we started military action against Assad, that, the, that it would not necessarily be a one-off set of things. It could escalate into a, a tit for tat. It could evolve into something uh, that was far more extended. He was also thinking, as he often did, three or four moves down the field. And he thought that if in the case of Syria, it's necessary and important to invest Congress in a decision on the use of force, then it will also be necessary to invest Congress in a decision to use force if necessary in Iran, should the uh, nuclear situation escalate and diplomacy fail. So he's got a whole chessboard going on with this. And he calls us all into the Oval Office. Now this is a Friday night, I guess. It's senior White House staff, not the principals yet. And he outlines his thinking. And he goes around the room as he typically does and asks each of us what they think. And everybody expressed agreement with the president. And I was the last one he called on because as National Security Advisor, that's what happens. You get sort of the, I don't know if it's the last word or the dregs, but you, <laughs> anyway. And he came to me and I said, Mr. President, I think you got to strike. You, you cannot wait for Congress. Um, and you can't wait for Congress because we have made very explicit what our intentions are. And I actually quoted Vice President Biden who likes to say big countries don't bluff. And I also recalled you know, Rwanda and the, uh, the fact that if, the, if this escalated, this could be his Rwanda. But the biggest point I made and the most passionate aspect of my argument was, I don't think Congress is gonna give you the authority. And I was the only one who said that. And I said it maybe because my instinct was whatever Obama wanted, the Republicans in Congress wouldn't give him if they had the ability to deny it to him, even if they thought it was right. And on the other side, on the Democratic side, there was not gonna be a stomach to endorse another military involvement in Syria. So I didn't see how it added up. And we concluded the meeting with him expressing confidence at, that we could work it with Congress and get it done. The next morning, he convened all the principals, who, many of whom he talked to individually overnight, and had the same discussion, pulled them all, and they all basically 
endorsed his view, even though, I, as I say in the book, I suspect that some of them were pulling their punches. And I, again, explained in shorter hand why I thought we weren't going to get congressional support. And as I also say in the book, I was right on the politics, and I think I was wrong on the policy. And the reason I say I think I was wrong on the policy was because we actually ended up, through diplomacy, and that agreement that the president got out of the Russians, to squeeze the Syrians to actually give up the vast bulk of their chemical weapons capacity, 1,300 metric tons of sarin gas and its inputs were removed and destroyed in Syria. And if there was some doubt about whether that was the right course, just recall what President Trump did. In 2017, 2018, he took our target list off the shelf, dusted it off, and executed the strikes. And the next day, nothing changed. And three years later, nothing's changed. They didn't get any leverage out of that. They didn't use it for diplomatic means. Whatever chemical weapons the Syrians kept or acquired, they still have. Not one metric ton. So sometimes the use of force, particularly in, in a case like that where the aim is to be limited, makes you feel good. I, I, I supported President Trump's decision to, uh, to bomb in Syria after the CW use in 17 and 18. But it didn't yield a better policy outcome. And as, you know, as imperfect as the deal was that we got, given that they either were reconstituted or kept some back, there's still 1,300 metric tons that they don't have to use against their population. So, you know, th this is, not black and white. I want to ask you about Benghazi, which was clearly the most painful experience for you, for the country. Your friend, Chris Stevens, the ambassador, was killed and three other Americans. And frankly, uh, as you describe it, and as many of us covering it at the time, felt that you were hung out to dry. By going out on Sunday morning television the weekend after that horrific attack, and working off of talking points that were scripted by the intelligence community, not able to reveal, as it's since been revealed, that the outpost involved was actually not a State Department facility. One of them. One, of them. one was, one was not. And you write very movingly about your mother. Whom you knew. Whom I knew, who was a great lady. And she warned you against going out. What did she say to you? You write about it in the book. It's quite, quite so wonderful. The moral of the story is listen to your mother. <laughs> that's, that's the shorthand version. The longer version of the story is it's Friday night before the Sunday that I'm meant to go on the shows. I had just come from Andrews Air Force Base where I and other members of the cabinet, the president and the vice president, were greeting the, the families who had lost their loved ones. And we received the caskets that had come home. It was you know, hor horribly painful for us, not to mention excruciating for the families. And my mom, three months earlier, after her fifth I've lost count, but I think her fifth cancer surgery had had a stroke. And she was still recovering from this stroke. So I wanted to stop by on my way home and, and check on her, see how she was doing, and just you know spend a little time. And so I go into her basement and where her kitchen is, and she's sitting at the table listening to CNN, as she usually does. Sorry. She also listens to MSNBC. <laughs> it's OK. But, uh, and she, without turning the television down, says, so what, what are you doing for the weekend? And I said, well, I'm taking the kids to Ohio State on Saturday for a football game against Berkeley, which is something I'd promised them many years ago, many months ago. And then on Sunday, I'm going on all five of the Sunday shows to talk about what's happened this week, which, if you all recall, was not only Benghazi, 
but it was the attacks on many of our diplomatic facilities around the world, not terrorist attacks, but violence by demonstrators. Um, it was also just over a week before the opening of the General Assembly at the United Nations and the issues of Iran and, uh, and um, Palestinian statehood and Netanyahu coming were all in the fore. So I was asked by the White House that afternoon if I would go on the shows. Uh, they had already asked Secretary Clinton and she declined, presumably it was said to me because she had a traumatic and exhausting week. She was tired and didn't want to do the shows. And they asked me if I would. And obviously this is not how I wanted to spend my weekend. I was going to go to Big Ten football, tailgate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I said yes because I felt that, you know, I'm on a team. It's, the team is, you know, in a hole and I should do my part. And my mother's gut on this from the very beginning was, I smell a rat. You should not do this. I'm like, Mom, what are you talking about? I've done this many times before. Why is Hillary not going out? And I gave the explanation. And she says, this, I just know this is not a good idea. You really shouldn't do it. I was like, Mom, come on. Like, just don't be ridiculous. It'll be fine. And of course it wasn't. I saw you that morning because I was there for Meet the Press. And so just one last thing. Yeah. If you think I was hung out to dry, which was your theory and my mother's, <laughs> but not mine, quite honestly, then who hung me out to dry? And my answer to that is I don't think I was hung out to dry. Somebody was going to go out on those Sunday shows. And you know what I think happened was that my mother understood intuitively what perhaps Secretary Clinton and Tom Donilon and others understood very concretely, which is that when you are the first person out in a crisis that's going to be highly politicized, something is going to be wrong about the information you have. And they're going to shoot not just the message, but the messenger. I learned that the hard way because it never occurred to me, frankly, to put myself before the team. And the Now it would. <laughs> <laughs> well, the furor among Republicans, I mean, it, it was fierce. And I have to ask you about your withdrawing your nomination, or the possibility that you would be the next Secretary of State. Well, it was fierce. I'm looking in the audience, and I'm seeing some of the people who supported me extraordinarily through this process. My team at USUN, I cannot tell you how much they went through and how incredibly supportive they were. And my husband, of course, who uh, I couldn't have done any of this without. Um, so ben, the, the Sunday show appearances were mid-September. President gets reelected in early November and I, had endured in the interim just like a nonstop pummeling. But I had naively thought that once the election was over, that you know things would move on and it would be okay. So I had that kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And then Lindsey Graham and John McCain decided that, you know, it was just the party was just starting. And they then made it their very baldly stated mission to make sure that I was not nominated to be Secretary of State, even though the President of the United States had made no decision about who he was going to nominate to be Secretary of State. Uh, and so they continued and escalated these attacks and the campaign. And then they, it wasn't just them. I mean, it was like a snowball. To the point where by early to mid-December, I made a decision in consultation with my family and a couple of folks on my team that it wasn't worth it. That, you know, a bloody, bruising, extended confirmation battle, which, by the way, I think we would have won, because, and, and so did the Senate Majority Whip, Dick Durbin, and he said so publicly, 
But it would have been extremely costly. You know, it would have been more for my family, more for my team, more for me. But worst of all, it would have been worse. It would have been bad for the country and bad for the president's agenda. He'd just gotten reelected. We had really important things to deal with, from the fiscal cliff to immigration reform. These were all his early priorities, and I just didn't. I didn't want to be in the middle of that. And so I made a decision that was difficult, but um, I think was right, I still think was right, uh, to convey to the president my desire not to be still in consideration for Secretary of State. Um, and you know, I knew I, I, had, I was still at the UN, I had a job that I enjoyed, and I also knew that uh, it may not be the last job I had in government. And you ended up being national security advisor and probably having um, a much more challenging in, in many ways and, and close relationship with the affecting of foreign policy. I'm, I love being national security advisor. I love being UN ambassador too. I mean, they're both great, great jobs. And I think being President Obama's national security advisor, somebody who was so serious and thoughtful and committed to what we were doing, and also just a lot of fun to be with. I wouldn't trade that. Um, and so I feel like <laughs> I have nothing but blessings. But, um, and I'd do that again in a heartbeat. I want to bring in some audience questions, but first I want to ask you about, you write about this so, so movingly, your family life and raising children in the midst of this environment with the pressures and dealing with aging parents and your parents' illnesses at the same time. How do you do all of that? Well, uh, first and most importantly, as I said earlier, I couldn't have done it without Ian. Um, Ian was... My stomach is grumbling, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ian was, was and is my rock. I love you, honey. Um, when I was in New York for four and a half years, Ian was, for half that time, the executive producer of the Sunday show on ABC this week. He was getting the kids up every morning, driving them to school, giving them breakfast, giving them dinner, making sure they got their homework done, taking them to sports while I'm up here at the UN, coming home on the weekends when I could. And then, for a large portion of that time, my father, who had had a stroke on Christmas Day of 2009, was living in our house. So he's doing all of that and supporting me emotionally and otherwise. Um, but the other side of the coin is, I was committed to the family and the kids. And I, and again, I got lots of witnesses here. If I had to be at a parent-teacher conference, or at a doctor's appointment, or at back to school night, or at a doctor's appointment for my parents, or at their hospital bedside, that's where I'd be. And at the end of the day, my view on this is, if you're gonna have teams that work, Everybody on that team, from the most senior to the most junior, has to know that they're cared for and cared for by the other people on that team. So if you have to step out to deal with a crisis in your life, you need to know that that team is going to close in behind you and fill the gap. And that you, know, you can be replaced in your work, even as national security advisor, certainly as UN ambassador. Somebody can step into the chair or somebody can run the meeting, you, you know, Fortunately, if you pick good deputies. But nobody can replace you at your parents' bedside when they're dying. And so that's always got to be first. And thankfully, President Obama understood that, and that was the tone he set at the top. That was a tone I tried to set for my teams at the U.S. Mission and at the NSC. And I think and, and I hope that everybody felt that they had to go do what they had to do with their, in their personal life when it was you know, really crunch time, and that the team had their back. 
Because if you don't feel like you're valued as a human being and your team has your back, the team's not going to be strong. It's not going to cohere. It's not going to hang together when stuff gets really tough. Well, I want to also bring in some questions from the audience. Um, what was the most difficult decision you made during your tenure with the Obama administration? So this is a challenge. I assume they mean in the policy realm. If the author of the question wants to revise and extend, please do. Mm -hmm. But my job, particularly as national security advisor, but also as UN ambassador, as a member of the cabinet level principles committee, was not actually at the end of the day to make the decisions. It was to recommend what the president should do about X, Y, or Z. Um, and as national security advisor, you run a process with the other cabinet level officials when, you know, when things are working normally. We should, and we're going to follow up saying, on that in a moment. <laughs> you know, in, in, in the Obama administration and the Bush administrations before it and the Clinton administration, which I served, when things are working normally, the principals convene, they look at the options, they assess the implications, and they each make recommendations. Sometimes we're in agreement, sometimes we're in disagreement. The national security advisor's job is to faithfully represent to the president what his top advisors recommend. And then at the end of that memo, to make my own recommendation as to what the president should do. So that's my job is to recommend uh, rather than decide. And you know, some of the toughest issues we faced, and I could list them all, but I, I would say that the, the most wrenching unsatisfactory, painful, difficult issue we dealt with was Syria. And not so much the red line issue of chemical weapons, which we described already, but the larger question of the extent to which the United States ought to get involved in the Syrian civil war for humanitarian purposes. Not, it, 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 this is, again, separate from getting involved to deal with ISIS, which we all agreed we had to do. And on this issue, the principles were deeply divided. And as I expand on in, in the book, there were only bad options and worse options. And that, I think, was the single hardest issue that, from my vantage point, we had to wrestle with. And just to explain, in the administrations I've covered, going back to Jimmy Carter, the National Security Advisor's role is to assess the options and consult with the other, the other members of the National Security Cabinet, and then synthesize and bring recommendations to the president. You and I have discussed this before, but I think the audience would be interested in your reactions to what happened a year ago in Aspen, when five days after a disastrous Helsinki summit where the president sided with Vladimir Putin against his own intelligence community and was being criticized for that and had a two-hour meeting with Putin with a no American note taker. I was interviewing the former head of national intelligence, Dan Coates, in Aspen. And there was a, a, a tweet from the White House that the president had invited Putin to come to Washington. Without consulting the Secretary of State, the Vice President, the national security team, the intelligence community, and as I later discovered, it was basically a phone call with Putin. He turned to John Bolton, said, let's invite Putin. Bolton turned to then Sarah Sanders, the press secretary, and he said, tweet that out. And that's how Dan Coates was notified on live television by me. Uh, and to my you know, regret, that led to what later became his exit. That was just the beginning of the end because he responded very transparently with sort of shock, surprise, and uh, without trying to spin that this had been a considered decision. To a long way of asking, what about the process where on the fourth National Security Advisor, there is no process? It's really important, folks, that we remember what normal is. Because if we have any hope of getting back to that, we can't lose sight. 
normal is that you don't make foreign policy decisions or pronouncements by tweet. Normal is that you don't hang up the phone with a foreign leader and without any policy process or consultation make an extraordinary statement like Vladimir Putin's coming to the White House in the middle of an investigation into Russia's interference in our election. Normal is that you don't launch planes to strike Iran after a half-assed policy process and then wake up and decide 10 minutes out that you're turning them around. Normal is that you don't invite your adversaries <laughs> on the south lawn of the White House in broad daylight to intervene in your elections. So we've lost all sense of normal and what Trump is doing, frankly brilliantly, is not just <clears throat> violating every norm, but violating every norm so transparently that he's in effect trying to rewrite the norms. And we can't let that happen. And that's not a partisan statement. That is just a statement of how responsible government has to work. And in a normal time, all of these very difficult issues would be the subject of extended policy work, starting at the assistant secretary or the deputy assistant secretary level, what we call the interagency working group, that would make recommendations to the National Security Council deputies, the number twos in all these agencies, who do the hardest work in government when they're working. And they really wrestle with these tough issues. And then they make recommendations or present options up to the national security principals, the cabinet level folks, who sit for hours and work through these tough issues and make a considered recommendation or split recommendation to the president. And on the most consequential issues, the president would sit down with his cabinet level advisors and talk it all through and then go home and think about it and make a reasoned decision. And then we'd have a process to announce it. There would be what we used to call a rollout. There's not, no rollout not anymore. <laughs> Well, to, to those who are not involved in foreign policy decision making, how important is it to return to the norms where ambassadors are not undermined and where there isn't a shadow foreign policy? And that most recently where on the revision and expansion and of an email investigation that could permanently preclude a whole generation of career diplomats from ever serving in another administration because they are being accused, I think improperly, of having violated secrecy because emails are being classified retroactively. It's vitally important that we return to normal. I mean, either we want to be a, a global leader who is able to advance and defend our interests and protect our security with allies and partners who trust us and join us in dealing with the most complicated challenges, whether it's Russian aggression or an Ebola epidemic or uh, you know, Paris climate negotiations or you know, dealing with Iran or North Korea. Or we're going to become the laughing stock and in effect you know, indistinguishable from a banana republic the way we have decisions made unilaterally in the personal interest of one individual without record, without process, without truth. It's a stark choice and it's ours actually to make. But if we don't get serious and recognize how dangerous this is and how detrimental it is to each of us individually as well as our country on the global stage, then it, it, it can become normal and it can become irretrievable. A year, this is a, a question from the audience. What would you have advised the President of the United States to do if Jamal Khashoggi had been killed while you were in the White House? I should say the this anniversary. President, any president. Any president. If you were in the White House when this had happened, and let me just say it, the anniversary of this horrific murder was yesterday. 
and Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, who has been held uh, to have at least known, ordered, or approved of this by our intelligence on moderate to high confidence, has now been restored in, on the world stage primarily because of the president's actions at the G20, bringing him forward and embracing him after having been somewhat isolated. So he now is in a position where his IPO of Aramco and a lot of other things are going his way again. And I'm not sure what the equities are. I mean, this is a very tough decision, but what would you have done if this murder had happened on your watch? The first thing we would have done is be very transparent and public about what we knew to be the case with respect to MBS's culpability. Yet the intelligence community was not confused. They understood and they reported to the administration and Congress what happened. And instead of validating that and legitimizing it, the president dissembled and deflected and distorted what he knew to be the case. So you gotta be transparent. The Saudi-US relationship is very complicated and it's got many facets to it. But for my money, the Khashoggi murder was only the most blatant and dramatic demonstration of Mohammed bin Salman's um, capriciousness and, and unreliability. I mean, we have, we've seen the war in Yemen. We've seen the diplomatic mess he got into with Canada because the Canadian foreign minister dared to criticize human rights in a tweet in Saudi Arabia, and that was basically the end of their bilateral relationship. We saw him lock up half the royal family in the Ritz-Carlton and extort all their money out of them. We saw him kidnap the prime minister of Lebanon and start a cold war with Qatar. And, and that's not a comprehensive list. So th this Khashoggi thing is just the latest and greatest of his very dangerous moves. And so I actually, I wrote a piece about this about a year ago in which I said, if, if I were making the decisions or if I were recommending what we do, I would recommend that we make very plain to the king that unless and until he finds us another principal interlocutor, this relationship is on ice. Doesn't mean we don't talk to the Saudis, but we're just not gonna deal, I would not deal with Mohammed bin Salman as if he is a legitimate representative. Another member of the audience is asking, why didn't President Obama and his administration more publicly warn Russia against interfering in our elections? We did, let me, let me, this is also another subject that I cover at, at some length in the book. And I think, Andrea, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm the first senior US official who was involved in that uh, challenge of Russian interference to write about it. And what we did, I go into at length, but in terms of warning, President Obama personally and directly in early September in China, the G20 pulled Putin aside and I, I don't think it's too stark to say threatened him told him we knew what he was doing. We were watching you know, for evidence that they did more than they'd already done, which they'd, st at that point, they'd stolen the emails and started putting them out. We, they had started to try to test the extent to which they could infiltrate the state systems. Our biggest concerns were twofold. One, that they would um, actually succeed in getting into some of the electoral systems in the states and corrupting the voter rolls or corrupting the actual tally. So that was overriding concern. The other was that they might take, false, take stolen information and falsify it, make stolen emails look like they were saying something that they weren't actually saying, um, distorting them, like it, the equivalent of a deep fake, but with email. And those were the things we were looking for. We knew that the horse, we, by the time this, we discovered this, a horse had left the barn in terms of this, the theft of the emails. The president reiter reiterated that warning very directly in early October on the same day that he publicly 
put out that uh, from the White House via the DNI and the Secretary of Homeland Security, that the intelligence community had concluded at the highest levels of the Russian government that they were trying to interfere in our elections. And that very stark warning that we took some time to get to because we we're trying to get the intelligence community to agree on the validity of the information at high confidence level came on the same day as the Access Hollywood tape, which was dropped not even two hours later, and the same day that WikiLeaks or whatever put out the, the stolen Podesta emails. So that very important and stark warning that we had carefully crafted and come to was probably the third story in the news that next day. Which says a lot. I, there's another audience question. What are your thoughts on Greta Thunberg? The young people. <laughs> She's phenomenal. She's so brave. She's so passionate. She's so smart. I, I mean, my, as a parent, as a grown up, my heart bursts in the same way it does for the Parkland kids. These are the leaders, the people who are fearless, who are tell, talking truth to power. And, you know, they are the ones that on a crappy day like today, when you, you know, you wonder how much worse can it get. You think about kids like that, and frankly, like my own kids, who are passionate and believe and want to be in the arena, and you feel better. These are the, thank God for Greta. Thank God for Emma Gonzalez and David Hogg and, you know, all these brave young people. They're not giving up. You're going to leave us in the dust, which is where we deserve to be. Well, I'm just going to say, from my perspective, I so admire public service and public servants and those who are willing to put their selves out there. And you exemplify that, Susan Rice. Tough Love, My Story of Things Worth Fighting For is a wonderful memoir and a combination of policy and personal experience. Our thanks to Susan Rice. We wish you great success with your book. I'm Andrea Mitchell, and our thanks to the Brennan Center for Justice for hosting this program. To all of you, please. I would just say this wonderful welcome. Please keep up the work here at the Brennan Center at brennancenter.org. Thank all of you for coming. This has been a wonderful audience and a great experience for me. Thank you. Thank you.